Hello and welcome to the Spinal Cord Injury Forum. I'm Stephen Burns, Medical Co-Director of the Northwest Regional Spinal Cord Injury System. The forums, the video recordings, and our online media content are made possible by a grant from the National Institute on Disability and Rehabilitation Research. Tonight we will be discussing sleep problems after spinal cord injury. Our speakers are Donald Don Fogelberg, Assistant Professor of Occupational Therapy in the Department of Rehabilitation Medicine. Me, Stephen Burns, Associate Professor and Physiatrist in the Department of Rehabilitation Medicine and Acting Director of the SCI Service at the VA Puget Sound Healthcare System in Seattle. We're also very pleased to have Chris Blanchard here tonight who has a spinal cord injury and will talk about his own experience with sleep apnea. Now please welcome our first speaker, Don Fogelberg. Thank you, and um, thank you guys for, for coming out on a night like this, and I'd also like to thank the model system people for inviting me to talk about this. This is an area um, that I've been interested in for a few years now. Um, I got interested in the issue of sleep for people with spinal cord injury when I was working on my dissertation, and for that I was looking at um, some transcripts of people with spinal cord injury who were living in the community who had recurring pressure ulcers. And I noticed as I was going through them that a good proportion, about 70% of the people that they interviewed talked at some point about chronic long-term sleep problems. And that kind of prompted me to go in and look at the literature and see what was known about it. And there's very little known. So for my part of the talk, I'll be doing an overview about sleep problems. Um, talking a little bit about why sleep is important, what it functions, a, a bit about types of sleep problems, um, and why we think that sleep might be affected by spinal cord injury, and then there will be a few tips for improving sleep quality. Um, right, so first, why is sleep important? Um, why does it matter? Now, most of these um, points are probably really familiar to you if you've had a night or two without good sleep. You just don't function that well the next day. You don't think that clearly. So sleep loss is associated with a, a range of cognitive problems, including um, decreased alertness. Um, you're not as alert to things happening in the environment. Uh, problems remembering. Um, different parts of our memory are really affected if we don't get enough sleep. We tend to have a shorter an attention span. and um, our judgment and decision making tend to be affected. And particularly, they've done some interesting studies on how we judge risk and the sorts of risks we take. And people tend to engage in riskier behaviors if they haven't had enough sleep. Um, this is one of the reasons probably that sleep loss is associated with a really high incidence of um, road traffic accidents and industrial accidents as well. Um, Sleep is also important because um, if you don't get enough sleep, you actually experience more pain. Um, the relationship of sleep loss and pain is complex. I mean, it's fairly common sense that if you're in pain, you're not going to sleep as well. It's going to be harder to fall asleep and stay asleep. But they've also done studies that show that if you don't get enough sleep, you become more sensitive to pain. So your experience of pain actually increases. And this can create a, a kind of vicious downward spiral. The more pain you have, the harder it is to get to sleep. The harder it is to get to sleep, the more pain you have. Um, and there's a similar relationship with depression. Um, sleep is often, sleep disturbances are often thought of as a symptom of depression and low mood. But they've found that um, sleep loss can predict depressive episodes. Um, if, if you look at people who develop a major depression, often that will be preceded by a long period of um, sleep problems. And finally, you know, sleep is associated with a range of health problems. Um, we know that it interferes with immune function and endocrine system functioning. And Sleep loss can lead to weight gain. There are a number of metabolic changes that happen that make it easier to gain weight. Um, diabetes has been associated with sleep loss and cardiovascular disease. And these last three, obesity, diabetes, and cardiovascular disease, are among the top causes of death in, in the US. So sleep is um, literally 
a life and death thing in some ways. Um, so now moving on to types of sleep problems. It turns out that there are just under 90 recognized varieties of sleep disturbance um, out there, and this is according to the Institute of Medicine report. So what I'm going to do tonight is focus on ones that seem particularly relevant to SCI, including the circadian rhythm sleep disorders and insomnia, and then Dr. Burns will be talking about sleep apnea, which is the, the most prominent of the sleep-related breathing disorders. Okay. So circadian rhythm sleep disorders are, are CRSDs. This is, um, these disorders generally occur when our internal clocks um, that, that govern things like our temperature regulation, et cetera, get out of alignment with the external clocks. Um, and our internal clocks generally run on more than a 24-hour cycle. They've done a series of experiments where they put people in enclosed environments so they're not exposed to sunlight or clocks or um, any of the, those cues as to what time it is. Um, and people tend to adjust to about a 24.8-hour day. So the, the timing for our internal clock is out of rhythm with the clock um, on the wall. And so we have to reset that clock on a regular basis. And that's reset um, by, um, I mean, it can be reset by taking melatonin, which is a hormone that kind of acts as a, um, it, it helps to signal the difference between dark and light cycles. Um, light exposure um, will also help reset this. And exercise and activity levels can help reset our clocks um, as well. Now, there are six major types of circadian rhythm sleep disorders. I'm just going to talk really briefly about these. It's broken down into the external types or the um, exogenous types. These are caused by external factors. Jet lag, we all know about jet lag and what happens if you fly across many time zones. You get out of sync. Your body is, clock is set to one time zone and you're in a different one. Um, and shift work is also considered a sleep disorder. Um, now, and then there are the internal types, um, or internal or endogenous varieties of sleep disturbance. And there are four major ones of these. Advanced phase sleep um, disturbance is when your body clock is set in advance of the regular clock. So you're falling asleep and waking up earlier than the kind of accepted cultural norms. Delayed phase is the opposite. Um, so if you're a night owl, and this, is, this kind of describes me a bit, you, you will tend to stay up later and want to sleep later than you're supposed to, ac according to culture. And it's not always that easy to shift this. Irregular phase, there's no set pattern. To it. it. It tends to wander all over and vary. And free running um, circadian rhythm sleep disorder is when your, your internal clock does not reset at all. So what happens is your sleep schedule gets moved back uh, between an hour and two hours each day. And again, these things are very resistant to, to just behavioral changes. Um, so it can be really disabling if you imagine wanting to sleep two hours later each day. Um, that could create some problems. Um, free running, if you kind of think about a person with a 25-hour day um, living in a 24-hour world. Um, and the other major type of sleep disturbance I'm going to talk about is insomnia. Um, basically, it's difficulty falling asleep, staying asleep, or both. And it may result in not getting enough sleep or having poor quality sleep. And so you're often, people will feel tired. Um, sometimes it's a very short acute phase. You have a couple of nights of um, insomnia. Or there are people who have described um, pretty much nightly insomnia for a period of years. 
And this is uh, highly prevalent. It's considered one of the most prevalent um, of the, the psychological problems in the U.S. now, with about 33% of the population experiencing insomnia um, at any given time. Now, of those 33%, around a quarter of the people will say it's, it's occasional insomnia. But somewhere around 9% of that one in three people say that it's pretty much a nightly problem getting enough sleep. Um, so this is a, a fairly widespread problem. Now, the traditional view of insomnia, you may hear the term secondary insomnia. Um, this is really the view that insomnia is caused by other factors, um, maybe other medical conditions, painful conditions, um, physical or neurological disorders like arthritis, chronic bladder infection, Alzheimer's disease. I mean, the list goes on and on. Almost any medical problem could lead to problems with getting enough sleep. And psychological dis disorders, um, depression, anxiety disorders, panic attacks are often associated with poor sleep. It, you may also have a, an insomnia problem secondary to treatment for some disorders. Um, some, um, like breathing and inhalers and so on like that, can actually have a stimulant effect. Just to keep things interesting, insomnia may be a result of another sleep disturbance, like a circadian rhythm disorder. So if you're on, say, a delayed phase sleep disorder, you're wanting to stay up later than you're supposed to, you may end up losing sleep each night because you're getting up. And so that would be insomnia secondary to the circadian rhythm disorder. And there are some problems with this. The, the fact that it's um, the perceived wisdom that insomnia is best thought about as secondary to other medical conditions because it means it often doesn't get treated as a condition in its own right. Um, the assumption is that if you treat the underlying condition, the insomnia will go away on its own. And that's not always the case. There's um, an emerging consensus among sleep researchers that insomnia really needs to be thought of as a disorder in its own right at times. Um, and some of the evidence for this, um, symptoms and consequences of insomnia are relatively consistent regardless of what disorder it's associated with. So if it's secondary to arthritis or a bladder infection or Alzheimer's disease, it will look pretty much the same. Um, the course of insomnia is often different from that of the associated disorders. So your arthritis might get better and that pain might get better, but your insomnia could carry on getting worse. So the two trajectories don't line up perfectly. Um, insomnia often responds to different types of treatment than the associated disorder. So you may have a, a pharmacological treatment take some drugs or medication for the underlying disorder, but the insomnia may respond better to a psychological approach. And insomnia can also generally be treated pretty much the same ways. The same things are effective for it, regardless of what else is going on. So all of these points are making um, sleep researchers really think that we need to look again at insomnia and not just assume that it's something that will clear up um, whenever the associated condition clears up. And they've done some interesting research um, looking at, say for example, a cognitive behavioral approach to treating insomnia in people who have depression and found that purely treating the insomnia will also help with the depressive symptoms to a degree. In people who have insomnia and pain, if the insomnia is treated, the pain will often improve somewhat, even without treating the pain. Um, so it's, it's important if you are having sleep problems to get it looked at and um, talked, um, diagnosed. So finally, why do we think sleep might be affected by spinal cord injury? Um, like I said, I, I came to this conclusion because I was reading a bunch of stories of people with spinal cord injury who had problems sleeping. Um, and this had me looking at, and it's important to say that all of this is kind of theoretical right now. This, these things have not been studied empirically to see if there's actually a result. But 
it makes some sense to think that these things might impact sleep. Melatonin, the hormone I talked about earlier that helps reset the internal clock. In high level SCI, cervical level SCIs, melatonin production is often decreased. So you're not making as much melatonin, so it's gonna be more difficult for your internal clock to reset. Um, in getting ready for this presentation, I was talking to Dr. Burns and he mentioned some literature on antidiuretic hormone. Um, and in people without a spinal cord injury, there tends to be a, a variation in the level of ADH. It, it, and because there's an increased level of ADH at night, that helps suppress urinary output. If you have a spinal cord injury, these levels often don't change overnight. And so it leads to increased urinary output um, at night. So you have to go to the bathroom more often than you would otherwise. And it makes sense that that could impact sleep. We know that spinal cord injury can interfere with body temperature regulation systems, our, our kind of internal thermostat. And we also know that the internal thermostat is one of the things that helps timing, determine the timing of sleep onset. Um, and like I said, none of these things have really been looked at to see whether they actually do impact sleep in SCI, but there are pretty good reasons to think that they might. Um, pressure ulcer prevention routines, you often will need to be turned and um, move around at night. Changes in activity levels and you may not burn as many calories. Um, and increased time spent in bed. And this is an important one to think about when we move on to the next section on tips for improving sleep. Um, so generally, these, these are called sleep hygiene recommendations. Um, Generally, the advice is to maintain a regular sleep schedule. This will help in resetting the, your internal clock and keeping that rhythmic. It also, um, if you avoid naps, just to skip to that one, it helps make sure that you're tired when it's actually bedtime. If you nap, it will um, decrease the amount of sleep you need. We only need so much sleep in a 24-hour period, and if you take a nap, you're not gonna be tired as early. Um, watch your intake of caffeine and other stimulants, especially in the afternoon. I decided to hide my caffeinated cola beverage um, from the camera for this. Um, see to it that your bedroom is a comfortable, quiet environment and dimmers on the lights and so on like that so that you can start to calm your nervous system down before sleep. Um, especially if you're somebody who watches the clock, you, and you get um, more anxious as the night goes on, thinking it's now one in the morning and I haven't been to sleep, it's two in the morning and I haven't been to sleep. Um, just hide the clock so you can't see it. And these last two, I have different bullet points there because I think they're kind of interesting in the context of a spinal cord injury. The advice is not to stay in bed when you're awake for more than about 10 minutes. Um, now, if getting in and out of bed is kind of a production, that may be difficult to do. And one of the standard things that they always say is don't watch TV or read in bed. Um, as the professionals at the American Sleep Association say, the bed is for sleep and panky-panky, and that's it. Um, and again, that's something that may or may not work for people with spinal cord injury. And on that note, I'll hand over to Dr. Burns. So uh, the title of my talk here is Sleep Apnea and Spinal Cord Injury. And uh, as is listed up here, I work primarily at the VA hospital here in Seattle. I've been studying sleep apnea as one of my research interests and treated a lot of patients with sleep apnea over the last 15 years or so. I essentially inherited a research study from one of my uh, coworkers and uh, this led to some other studies including some work with the sleep researchers at Harborview. And uh, I wasn't sure what I would be covering exactly in the talk, so I put this disclaimer up here of speaking about my own opinions on the topic and anything I'm, I'm on my wish list for uh, spinal cord units. Uh, I'm not uh, uh, automatically putting that on the list for the VA, but I think they're good things to consider. So this is an uh, outline of the order of going through things. Uh, what is sleep apnea? How do we diagnose it? Um, 
why is it so common in people with spinal cord injuries, how do we treat it, and then uh, some areas for research and where I think clinical programs could go. So disturbances of sleep and problems with alertness, it could be a minor inconvenience with a small effect on quality of life, or this could be a big deal overwhelming uh, most aspects of someone's life. Uh, to get refreshing sleep and uh, be able to be alert and participate, we need enough hours of sleep, and we want this to be with minimal interruptions, if, if any. Uh, the parts of sleep that are the most restful are the deep phases of sleep, and then when the body trans transitions into uh, REM dream phase of, of sleep. Um, and so if that uh, all goes off well and we're alert during the daytime, then we have enough energy to participate in, in activities. We're not falling asleep as we're trying to socialize with people or falling asleep as we're uh, driving our cars. And ideally, we would maintain a high level of alertness until it's bedtime and we start to wind down and then fall into some nice restful sleep. But there seem to be many barriers to both of these accomplishments in people with spinal cord injury. A lot of reasons exist why people would have poor sleep quality. Uh, for example, needing to awaken a number of times during the night or have someone wake us up uh, for things. For example, doing intermittent catheterization in the middle of the night um, or turning ourselves in bed to protect our skin. Pain can definitely interfere with falling asleep and maintaining sleep, and the same goes for muscle spasticity. We know that physical activity is helpful for promoting sleep, and many people with SCI have limited act options for, for exercise. And depression is another factor that can interfere with people's ability to fall asleep and, and stay asleep for the full night. So uh, daytime sleepiness, the uh, largest impact, of course, would be if people are getting poor sleep quality, not enough or uh, not sound enough. But there are also a number of medications that can affect alertness in people uh, with SCI, things commonly prescribed like pain medications, uh, antispasticity medications, and a lot of the medications used for uh, treating neurogenic bladder. Again, physical inactivity because exercise is uh, uh, helpful and depression could be interfering there as well. Now, sleep apnea and other forms of sleep disordered breathing are definitely one of the most important medical causes for poor sleep quality and excessive daytime sleepiness in people with, with SCI. It's a very common disorder in people with SCI. Um, and beyond the uh, daytime sleepiness, it can cause other health problems, heart problems, and lung problems. Now, fortunately, there are treatments that are, that are available, a range of treatments, and uh, many people are able to uh, tolerate those, accept them, and have a dramatic improvement in their symptoms, as well as avoid some of the health consequences. Now, uh, why sleep? Well, it's uh, known from other disorders, um, uh, whether that's heart disease, whether it's neuromuscular diseases, um, in fact, even for the, the general population. Breathing uh, is more difficult when people are, are asleep. We know from progressive disorders, things like ALS, people will progress as their disease progresses. They'll go from normal breathing to some sort of uh, mild snoring to severe snoring. Um, and then from, uh, from that, they're actually having obstructive sleep apnea where the air is not moving in and out uh, when they're trying to, trying to breathe. From that, people would progress to needing a ventilator at night and then uh, needing a ventilator at, at all times. So these phases of sleep apnea, mo moving through that, would be normal in somebody who is progressively losing lung function as breathing becomes more difficult. Now, sleep medicine is a relatively new, new field. I'm, I don't have subspecialty training in it. I just have a lot of experience treating people with SCI with these disorders. Uh, the subspecialties that primarily do this are pulmonary medicine, neurology slash psychiatry, and otolaryngology, but generalists as well, internists and pediatricians, uh, can also specialize in this. And it's also, it's a relatively recent discovery that it's so common in the general population, as well as very common in people who have some sort of neuromuscular disease, some sort of weakness of their breathing muscles. Obstructive sleep apnea is the most common type, and it's what we'll primarily be covering here in detail. So an apnea, as we define it here, it's a pause in air movement. Air is not moving in and, in and out, uh, making a breath, uh, while the patient is attempting to, uh, to breathe. Um, a pause of at least 10 seconds of the airflow is what's used for defining uh, an episode, and that would be associated with a drop in the oxygen level in the, in the body. That would count as an episode of, of apnea. The cause in obstructive sleep apnea 
uh, is that the soft palate and the tongue, the structures that are at the back of the throat, obstruct the airway. And uh, uh, if we were trying to suck something with a syringe or suck something up through a garden hose, we can pull things in. We never have the experience of trying to suck a fluid like air or liquid through a floppy tube. But as you start to pull through a structure like that, a floppy airway, it collapses and pull as hard as you can. Nothing's going to flow, flow through that until the, the tube is, is stiffened. We know that it's uh, worse when people are sleeping on their, on their back, as you can sort of see in the slide here, because of gravity. So the, uh, the, the pinkish structures here, so this is someone's head cut sideways, top of the skulls up here, nose, mouth. Uh, this huge thing here is the tongue. The tongue is actually a pretty big muscle. And the, the blue is the airways. So the, the purple pink is what's obstructing the soft, soft palate and the tongue uh, down here drifting to the back as someone falls asleep and again assisted by, by gravity so that the air can't uh, come from here and head down toward the lungs. So the airway is obstructed. So when that happens and no air is moving in and out, the oxygen level drops and uh, the brain starts to become unhealthy, senses something bad is, is going on here and needs to wake up a little bit to take a deeper breath open up those airway muscles and let some air, air pass through. And uh, this tends to happen uh, particularly in the deepest phases of, of sleep, the phase four and in uh, REM sleep, things are, are more disrupted. And uh, those are the phases that you need to go into and stay, stay in to be well rested. So as been, has been mentioned, the most common co consequence is excessive daytime sleepiness because your brain is always waking up a little bit to try to do some, some better breathing. Uh, but there are medical consequences as well. Now, in the general population, uh, sleep apnea is said to occur in about 3 to 4 percent of males and 1 to 2 percent of females. The numbers kind of vary depending on how we want the cutoff, how we define an apnea, how many ap apnea episodes per hour, um, but these are the generally accepted numbers. So uh, based on uh, how frequently the apneas happen and that someone has to have some symptoms attributed to it. That's how it's usually defined. Um, obesity is the main risk factor in the general population primarily thought to be just a compression from the excess fat and not having uh, as uh, an airway that stays open as well. Also with abdominal fat being something that the diaphragm has to push against. Um, but whatever the, the reason is, obesity is the number one factor. Um, it's generally diagnosed with uh, a sleep study, also known as a polysomnogram, which we'll go into in some detail. And it's generally treated with something called CPAP, or continuous positive airway pressure, which is given by a, a mask that goes over the mouth or nose. And we'll go into that in detail as well. So uh, looking more broadly, that obstructive sleep apnea is not the only uh, breathing problem that occurs uh, during sleep. Um, OSA is the most common. And as we've described it, you can think of it as snoring that's so severe that there's just no air moving. It's a severe snore. There's, not, there's, there's no way for the air to move for a bit. Central sleep apnea is, is quite a bit different. So if someone is not attempting to breathe in, their brain is just forgetting to breathe for some period of time, and there's a pause. There's no effort to breathe, and of course, there's no airflow either happening. And in general, it's a rare disorder in people uh, in the general population. Uh, then the last one to mention here would be hypoventilation, or the, the fancy term chronic alveolar hypoventilation is what the, the articles call it. What this is is that there's not enough breathing to go on to satisfy the respiratory needs, but it's not that there are long pauses. There are shallow breaths or just a slow breathing rate, but it's not this period of breathing along and a pause, breathing along and a, and a long, long pause. Um, the carbon dioxide level can actually start to rise before we see any change in the oxygen uh, level with that. It's also a relatively rare disorder in the general population. So those are three types of sleep disordered breathing. It's not just obstructive sleep apnea that can occur. The consequences of sleep apnea in the general population are listed here. Excessive daytime sleepiness, uh, a generalized dysfunction in uh, cognition over the long run. People can actually lose some of their cognitive abilities. Um, uh, and then some cardiovascular disease, so hypertension, high blood pressure, especially one that's very resistant to other medications, uh, multiple medications. It's something that physicians think about testing for. 
uh, some other uh, cardiac and pulmonary diseases, some permanent changes to the lungs and to the blood vessels that go through the lungs. And then uh, lastly, patients are predisposed to uh, injuries from, uh, from accidents, particularly motor vehicle crashes. Some studies say a, a greatly increased risk of crashes. Now we'll move on to a description of how sleep apnea is usually diagnosed. And uh, before that, let's think about what is it that we would want to, want to be measuring. And so we're concerned about breathing, and why do we breathe? Well, two main reasons. We need to bring oxygen into the body, and then we need to get carbon dioxide out of the body. So we would definitely, uh, in an ideal world, be measuring both of these things uh, to see how someone's breathing is, is going on. So uh, the simplest way, I don't have listed here, in a hospital we would take a, a long needle, not too long, jab it into someone's wrist, into an artery here, and take out a sample of the blood and send it down to the lab. So that's not going to work very well if someone's asleep. They're not going to stay asleep very long if we're doing that. So we need to do, do what we can non-invasively to get the same information. So for the oxygen level, we use something called an oximeter, which I think most uh, uh, people here are probably familiar with. So uh, it's also known as a pulse ox because it's measuring the pulse or the heart rate. And uh, all it is is a sensor that goes on the fingertip hooked up to some sort of a box or even a self-contained unit, and it's measuring the oxygen level in the, in the blood. What the number that we see, it's the percent saturation. What of the possible amount of oxygen that could be stuck to the red blood cells is on there. And in general, we like to see that number up in the 90s. That's pretty good. If it's below 90, something, something's going on. Uh, carbon dioxide is actually not uh, easy to measure non-invasively. There are devices that measure this, uh, something called an end-tidal CO2 uh, measurement. Um, there's some technical issues. It's not, not at all an easy thing to set up. And so that number actually is not, that, uh, that measurement isn't something that we usually uh, do when someone has a formal sleep study done. There are specialized reasons, but that's not part of the routine. So. We'll start off with the, uh, the Cadillac version of the sleep study, the polysomnogram uh, or polysomnography. So I put the letters up here so we can think about what it is. The P for poly, multiple, somno, sleep, and graphy, uh, gram. When we use that, measuring a bunch of things and in the old days writing it out on long, long strips of paper. Now it's all done with computers for the most part. Uh, but on a representative one up here, just tons of tons of things being, being measured as this is going on. Um, and that's basically the, the bottom line. It's, if, it's, if it has something to do with sleep and there's some way to measure it, then they've got a device in the lab to, to do this. So the things that are particularly important, breathing effort. Is someone's chest moving? Uh, is it expanding? Uh, is someone uh, attempting to make a, make a breath? Is air flowing in and out of the mouth? It could be something as simple as a thermometer that detects the change in, uh, change in heat. Um, we want to know about the, uh, the stages of sleep, um, so uh, the eyes move in certain phases and the brain, brain waves move as, as well in certain patterns, so we want to be measuring that stuff. Um, body position, when people are on their stomachs and the uh, upper airway stuff is moving, that's going uh, to affect airway obstruction. Uh, limb movement disorders, this could be as fancy as having video the whole night of you sleeping with a, uh, a camera that can uh, show what's happening with movement. Uh, noise from snoring. Of course, we want the oxygen level, the heart rate, um, and we can also measure arterial tone. So that's kind of the Cadillac approach to it um, in a lab. Um, so you know, shown here is somebody all kind of wired for sound, the belt on, EEG, sort of the works, and you know, a big lab of equipment somewhere else. And it might be a little hard to read here, black against blue, but okay, relax, and we'll let you fall asleep like normal. So you're kind of wired for sound, cameras running. Okay, go to sleep, have a normal night's sleep. So maybe not a typical situation, maybe not the easiest for some folks. Uh, this is just a cartoon showing uh, phases of sleep. Uh, so if someone's awake, we're at this level. Uh, four is the deepest phase of sleep. This is how things are progressing during the, during the night. So, uh, so someone's moving from awake, lighter phases of sleep. Uh, eventually they get down to some deeper, deeper phases. And then what we start to see is periods of REM sleep. And actually the brain behaves more or less like it's awake in those phases when, we're, when, when REM is occurring, when we're, when we're dreaming. So some deep sleep uh, uh, here, and then REM sleep. More REM sleep later in the, in the night and not uh, falling into as deep a, deep a phase. So that's the sort of information that we can only get with a polysomnogram with a, 
uh, head wired up with all those, those leads on there. So we can do something that's less than, less than that and get a lot of the information. These have been called lots of things, limited sleep studies or limited channel studies or a cardiorespiratory study because that's mostly what it's, what it's looking at. The equipment's not as fancy, so it's not as expensive. Um, it's pretty easy uh, for someone to set this up. There's not as much fancy wiring to the head. Um, so what do we get? We get oxygen level. We get the heart rate. We can tell if there's chest movement um, and if air is flowing in and out primarily. So we're not getting the stuff for sleep staging. And this is what it looks like. This is an old-fashioned uh, paper printout. And for example, on the bottom here, someone's oxygen level, it's going up, it's going down, it's going up, it's going down. So there are periods of apnea that are, that are occurring. Other things being shown here are the effort of someone uh, taking deep breaths to try to get some air moving because their brain just woke up, and then uh, regular breaths um, and airflow down in here. So uh, a, a much smaller number of channels there. We can go uh, less fancy than, than even that. So something that we're using at my hospital recently is something called a watch pat. The pat stands for peripheral arterial tone. And this is combined with a uh, pulse ox like we described before. Uh, it's all contained in this box with a monitor on one finger, a monitor on, on the other. This pat, the peripheral arterial tone, this rises and falls as someone has an episode of sleep apnea. You're turning up your sympathetic tone, the body's getting unhappy because there's apnea, and then you're breathing and the tone goes down. So it's another thing we can measure pretty easily that's telling us something's not right with the, with the breathing going on. Now we don't know whether this happens routinely in people with spinal cord injuries. We know that the sympathetic nervous system's function is altered. It's not that it doesn't function at all, but it's messed up in some ways. So uh, we're, we're not sure ourselves whether this is going to give us uh, very reliable information just from the, the arterial tone. But it is giving us a nice pulse ox recording continuously through the night. That's another option, just an oximeter by itself that does a continuous recording. It's definitely better than nothing if, if nothing's avail available. Just having a regular hospital pulse ox sitting out in the hallway and alarming is not a good strategy. The nurses will just get annoyed every time the alarm goes off, and pretty soon they'll turn it off. They say, oh, yeah, it alarmed a lot of times. The patient couldn't, uh, you kept waking the patient up. So uh, you do need one that does some sort of recording. When these sleep studies are interpreted, uh, there are all sorts of numbers that come back, but it's pretty straightforward what we look at. The how many apnea events per hour, it's usually reported as the AHI, the apnea hypopnea index. Hypopneas are sort of short of a full apnea. Uh, and in general, 15 or more episodes per hour, that's considered significant. It's happening often enough we have to worry about this. Fewer events might be enough to disrupt sleep um, and be causing a problem, but 15 is the number we're looking for. This number will only go so high in, in an hour, you can only have so many events. So it's not like we're looking for numbers that are way up in the hundreds. That's necessarily worse. You could have uh, you know, 30 really long episodes, and that could, that could be plenty bad. Another thing we can easily look at is the oxygen desaturations. And it's usually reported uh, you know, what percentage of the study is somebody having a normal saturation, what percentage of the time is it a little bit too low, what percentage is it getting kind of scary low, and so on or what was the absolute lowest oxygen level during the whole study. There's a lot of other stuff that's reported on the, on the fancy reports, total time that someone was asleep, um, amount of time that they were in REM sleep, and, and so on. But it's the top ones that we mostly concentrate on. Now let's move back to uh, people with spinal cord injuries um, and how, how common it is. So uh, looking at acutely injured uh, uh, people, there aren't that many studies out there. There are two very good quality Australian studies, and there's a large one going on in Australia now that's looking at how we should diagnose this early, early on. Uh, but in those studies, depending on the time point, somewhere 60, 75 percent, upwards of 80 percent of people with new tetraplegia had uh, sleep apnea. We conducted a pilot study as well at Harborview. We really didn't get very far with our enrollment, and that was kind of a finding of the study. It was really hard to do the testing during our specified first six weeks or so after, after injury. Um, it was just uh, hard getting, getting good data. And some of the reasons here, patient, patients who were highest risk, they were still on a ventilator or just weaning off. We don't want to study them on the ventilator. The ventilator's doing the breathing. If they still had a tracheostomy in, this bypasses the spot where people obstruct. And that's how sleep apnea used to be treated in the old days. Just put a hole through here below where it obstructs. And, just breathe in and out through the hole. 
and a lot of the patients were just medically unstable. So it seemed like some of the highest risk patients, based on other risk factors we know, we just couldn't study them early on. So they might slip through attention during their initial rehab. In people with long-term injuries, it kind of depends on the population you study, people with tetraplegia or people with any level of spinal cord injury. Did you do fancy testing or low-tech stuff? What were your cutoff scores? In general, the studies range 35 to up to 60% of people with spinal cord injuries, mostly tetraplegia in those studies, have, um, have sleep apnea. Not many studies uh, with enough people with paraplegia to say, say much about how common it is. It looks like it's relatively common. Some of the older studies really weren't that great saying what type of sleep disordered breathing was, this was. Um, and pooling a bunch of those studies, to me, it looked like close to a quarter of the patients actually had partially or mostly central sleep apnea and not obstructive. There are a ton of possible reasons why sleep disordered breathing would be common after spinal cord injury. I'll just mention a couple of them, of them out of here. Obesity is probably a risk factor in, the, in people with SCI. Um, weakness of muscles breathing in probably is, as well as uh, an alteration of breathing mechanics. When your diaphragm moves down, um, the chest wall, rather than expanding, um, uh, collapses in, and it's ineffective in moving air in, in and out. Um, uh, rarely, the brainstem can be affected by syringomyelia extending all the way up there. We don't think that that's a common, uh, common reason. Um, uh, spinal cord injury is a lot more common in males. Sleep apnea is more common in males, so that's going to bring it up there. Um, somebody suggested to me, to me, well, if people with sleep apnea fall asleep and have motor vehicle crashes, well, you know, maybe that's people with sleep apnea falling asleep and maybe it predated it. That's not a, a major explanation for it. You know, some other sort of better, better explanations, uh, medications are probably a big, big factor. Um, a lot of patients just can't uh, uh, sleep well in any position. Um, uh, besides uh, uh, being flat on their back, don't sleep well in, in their, uh, when they're on their stomachs. And so they can't get into a position where sleep apnea is less, less likely. So a whole bunch of causes, probably multiple things to make the, uh, make the rate so high. Uh, a little bit on baclofen, since that's a very commonly taken medication in people with spinal cord injuries, the possible mechanism would be a relaxation of those upper airway muscles that need to dilate the airway and keep it open when we're, when we're sleeping. Um, there was a study where they gave people who were bad, uh, bad snorers without SCI, gave them one dose of baclofen. It didn't seem to do anything to their snoring, so they said, well, it's probably not a, not a factor. But some studies looking specifically at people with spinal cord injury, probably four studies with different sorts of designs, show some sort of association. Uh, one study said particularly people with very high doses of baclofen, 80 milligrams a day, which is the max that's usually recommended. It gets a little complicated because people who are on high doses of baclofen are going to be sleepy. They're more likely to get studied to look for sleep apnea. So um, it, it can be, uh, there could be some confounding in those studies. Uh, as I said, obesity, it probably is a risk factor, but it doesn't seem to be the main one in people with SCI. The neurologic classification or somebody's neurologic status, uh, what we do know, uh, it's common in people with complete as well as incomplete, and I mean motor incomplete injuries, um, and it seems to be more common in people with, with tetraplegia um, at a C5 level. So I need to throw two graphs up here just so we have some data. So this is from a study that I did. The, um, this was a case control study where we studied people known to have sleep apnea with spinal cord injury. We compared them to our population who had not been diagnosed with sleep apnea. These are the ASIA impairment scores, a, a motor a, or a complete injury, sensory incomplete, and different degrees of motor incomplete. This is the ASIA or AIS scale. And uh, basically, in the cases, we had kind of similar mixes relatively of A's, B's, C's, and D's, maybe a little more C's in the cases. So it's not the case that this only happens in people with complete paralysis at a, at a cervical level. People who are walking around, uh, it's relatively common in, in them as well. And this is showing just something similar based on neurological level, C4 through C8, the ones that we were studying here. So you can see in our controls, C6, uh, the pink here was the most common, whoops, versus the uh, the cases where um, uh, C5 was a little more common. So probably a little higher level injury is, is predisposing people as well. So uh, 
other than those problems I listed for the general population, the consequences of sleep apnea, what else might be a consequence uh, specifically in people with spinal cord injury? This is not all stuff that's, that's proven, so nobody get shocked about the sudden death down here at the bottom. But um, difficulty with uh, new learning and participation in rehabilitation. Imagine all the things that you're asked to learn, to do for yourself, new physical skills, transferring, taking care of yourself, monitoring your health conditions. Uh, throw on top of that, suddenly having sleep apnea, not getting a good night's sleep, you have pain, everything's disrupted, poor, uh, uh, poor environment to be sleeping in the hospital in the, you know, in the first place. So uh, it's not making things any better. Um, after you leave the hospital, uh, you're going to have more difficulty uh, make, making sure that you're staying healthy, attending to your needs, uh, being safe, and um, protecting your skin, and so on. Uh, low oxygen level can't be a good thing for uh, pressure ulcer formation or healing, healing pressure ulcers. Um, it's definitely um, uh, going to be a potential for psychological uh, factors, so adjusting to disability is going to be more difficult. Um, and then this idea of, of sudden death, there are a lot of unexplained deaths in the first year after spinal cord injury. Autopsy shows nothing. We say it was probably something heart related, but uh, whether that was something precipitated by a bad apnea and low oxygen level is, is definitely possible. So uh, some barriers to diagnosing this in people with spinal cord injury, we don't always, always think about it. There are lots of reasons, medications and so on, for our patients to appear sleepy to us or be complaining, uh, complaining of being sleepy. Uh, the stereotype of a uh, really obese patient as being the prototypical one with sleep apnea. Well, that's not, not necessary. People as thin as can be with spinal cord injuries can, can have it. As I mentioned earlier, it can be difficult to get the studies during the acute period where there's the closest monitoring going, going on. And I'd, say, I'd term some of the things just benign neglect. Nurses are used to seeing people with SCIs on rehab units breathing with horrible, obvious apnea, just looking at them. There's no air movement. This person must have sleep apnea. Well, this is just how patients breathe. Everybody on this unit breathes, breathes like this. Um, and then maybe a concern from some providers, oh, I've made things so complicated for this person in their life already. They have to do bowel care. They have to self-cath. They have to do this and transfer this. Do I really need to tell them that they have to sleep with a mask on their face and giving them air? It doesn't seem to be causing a problem. Let's, let's just not go looking. Things are, things are complicated enough. Um, and spinal cord specialists really uh, have not gotten particular training in, in sleep disorders and, and treating it. Um, I uh, did a survey of spinal cord specialists. They were actually more comfortable taking care of people who were on ventilators. Now, ventilator dependence is a serious thing. Uh, it doesn't happen that commonly. It's a big deal on the unit. They say, well, I'd rather take one of those complicated patients than, uh, than deal with this problem that's actually affecting more than half my patients. Um, and then sleep medicine specialists, they mostly see obstructive sleep apnea in obese people with chronic health conditions but not spinal cord injuries. So they might completely miss the fact that there's another sleep disorder going, going on. Somebody's hypoventilating. We don't measure carbon dioxide necessarily. And then there are a lot of issues around the sleep labs that I'll, that I'll go into. So what do they want in the sleep lab? What was my discussion with my sleep specialist when we started studying some acute patients? You know, ideally this would be done in the sleep lab, not in a hospital room or other uh, realistic environment um, to see how you're really sleeping. Um, you know, the mattresses in the lab, it's something that's going to be comfortable for most people but may not be protective enough. Um, they don't want anyone coming in and waking you up. You know, do you really have to cath in the middle of the night? Does somebody have to come in and, and turn you? Um, really, ideally, you're just sort of alone there with no attendant help or anything else. They want you to get a good night's sleep the way that they, they see it, but that's not how most people with SCI are sleeping. Um, so it's not going to be a typical night. Um, there are also some issues with accessibility of, of labs. Um, in a lot of hospital settings, there's no sleep lab that's available there at all. So we'll move on to uh, treatment. So the uh, first line treatment for obstructive sleep apnea is usually uh, CPAP, continuous positive airway pressure therapy. So there's a mask positioned over the nose or nose and mouth, and there's a bedside pump here and it's uh, pumping pressurized air in, and this is puffing the airway open at that spot where it, where it obstructs, where the airway is collapsing down. So someone is able to breathe in and out with things, things popped open. Yeah, this is intentional with all the uh, tubing coiled around his uh, neck there. He's, dist he's distressed if you can't tell. 
Uh, there are all different varieties of mask. This is a plain nasal one. This is called nasal pillows, little uh, prongs that go up into the, the nose. A couple varieties of full face masks, a really full face mask here. Now a variation on CPAP is bilap, BiPAP, bilevel positive airway pressure. And uh, the pressure that someone's breathing in alternates between a higher pressure at the time you're breathing in and then a lower pressure uh, to let you, uh, as you're breathing out. And it's really designed so that uh, it's a minimal time that the high pressure is coming where the mask is pounding that pressure right, right onto you to make it more comfortable. Um, it'll synchronize with your effort to breathe. It can sense that that's going on. Um, there's something that you can add on some of the units called a backup rate. So this would be useful for somebody with central sleep apnea. If this device doesn't detect that you're taking a breath, it will cycle the pressure high and low to try to get you to, to breathe. Now, if you think about that, that's a little bit like a ventilator that someone is on if they can't breathe on their, on their own. And we really can get that effect if we dial the, dial the numbers in. So for somebody with uh, weakness of their breathing muscles, um, we can be treating them with BiPAP. It's very much analogous to them being on a, on a ventilator and assisting them with their, with their breathing. Um, but it's coming through a, a non-invasive interface. There are other treatments available. There's something called an oral appliance, uh, uh, which is essentially a double retainer plate where it pulls your, your jaw forward and that tugs your tongue and other structures along and that'll open things up in the, uh, in the airway so that it doesn't collapse down. Um, they can also do something similar with some, uh, some surgery. They can kind of cut holes in your, your jaw and extend things and change around the, the whole geometry of your face. Um, they can drag your tongue forward, taking a little chunk of bone and pulling it out and twisting it, all sorts of stuff that seems really, really bizarre. Um, uh, along the same lines, you could uh, just get gravity into the picture, so sleep on your stomach if you're able to breathe in that, that position, so gravity's pulling all this stuff forward. It's uh, traditionally been done by sewing a tennis ball into the back of someone's pajamas. It's uncomfortable laying on the, the tennis ball. I don't advise this for people with spinal cord injuries. You might get a tennis ball shaped pressure ulcer on your, on your back. Um, uh, and, uh, oh, and this is my slide showing the, uh, the surgeries here. So one approach would be uh, this U triple P procedure, the uvulopallidopharyngoplasty. Um, and they cut out some of this excessive tissue that's, uh, that's obstructing the, uh, the airway. Um, and then there are some other choices of airway surgeries as, as well. This is actually showing the, the uh, jaw lengthening uh, uh, routine here, uh, getting the tongue, tongue forward. Um, the uh, historical uh, treatment was, um, uh, as I have here, just opening a hole in the throat here, so doing a, a tracheostomy to allow someone to breathe. And uh, uh, that was, uh, that's all that was available in the old days. So. Um, uh, moving on to uh, our own experience, getting people uh, onto some sort of treatment. So uh, we did a uh, follow-up study on 40 patients that had been diagnosed with uh, sleep apnea, people with SCI. 20 of them were using CPAP or BiPAP. Two had had one of these surgeries, the UPPP. One person was getting supplemental oxygen, which by itself is really not an effective treatment. One was using one of these oral appliance and then 16 were not getting any sort of treatment. And looking at some national VA data, the treatments are all over the place. Some VAs really seem to pursue everything, try an oral appliance, refer everybody for surgery. Some of them, uh, those, are, those are done very rarely, um, even if someone is not tolerating CPAP or BiPAP. Um, so for those patients, the 20 patients who reported back to me who were using it successfully, they were using it on average six and a half nights per week seven hours uh, per night. So compared to what the general population reports, this is a lot of use. So it makes me think these people are benefiting in, in some way. And that's how they rated things as well. How helpful on a zero to 10 scale, they rated it almost a nine. And how unpleasant the treatment was, only a three. Now this is biased. This is only the people that were continuing to use it. So there is a subset of people who are using it quite a bit and reporting a big benefit and finding it not so unpleasant. For those who couldn't tolerate it, um, one complaint was that they just couldn't sleep or sometimes even couldn't breathe when it was on them. Um, and this is possible with a very high pressure of CPAP in somebody who doesn't have very strong breathing muscles, we may actually make it more difficult for them to, to breathe. It hasn't been studied well, but theoretically our first line treatment might not actually help it at all. Um, 
they won't fall asleep because they're so uncomfortable, and sometimes the study looks better if we're not looking at sleep, but that's, uh, that's just an artifact. Discomfort from the mask was a common complaint. That's the number one complaint for the general population. Claustrophobia, inability to uh, reposition the mask, just tweak the straps a little bit and get it, get it just right. And we think people with uh, higher level injuries who don't have the hand function to manipulate the mask are having a harder time accepting uh, treatment. So now moving on to some unanswered questions and what I think we should think, be thinking of for clinical programs. Um, a lot of this I've, I've mentioned. So we have a lot of different types of tests available. The full polysomnogram in a lab is an expensive and uh, difficult option for, uh, for some patients. Do we really need that or could we do one of these more limited studies? I'm very interested to see if these studies using peripheral arterial tone are giving us any uh, useful information, uh, additive information. Um, maybe we should think about screening just about everybody. These devices are not that expensive. Sleep apnea is really common in this population. Should we build in a routine that we're, we're just going to screen everybody at a certain point or screen people in follow-up? Um, some of the risk factors are things we could modify. So medications, for example, oral baclofen, would we avoid some of the risk by having people on other medications uh, to treat their spasticity or using intrathecal baclofen? Um, we don't know if weight loss would be beneficial in the same way it can be in people in the general population, but it's potentially modifiable. Uh, maybe BiPAP should be our first choice for the reasons I mentioned, um, that we can uh, uh, treat uh, more complicated problems with that. Maybe the surgery is a good, uh, good choice. A lot of patients with SCI probably just have very minimal airway obstruction, so just taking a little tissue out with surgery or using this oral appliance to drag things forward a, a little bit it uh, might on average not take very much from those treatments to, uh, to get the airway open enough. And then kind of moving into the, the clinical and uh, you know, systems uh, issues. Um, so with the existing sleep lab programs, how could we really improve it? So if sleep medicine physicians were educated better about the SCI specific considerations, what someone might need to be safely studied in a lab um, uh, as far as attendant care and so on and make them open to that, um, modify the lab to make sure it's as accessible as, as possible, uh, give permission that somebody can bring an attendant along. That's what's done in our uh, VA lab that's, uh, uh, that's located in Tacoma. Um, and then uh, we're looking at redesign of our spinal cord unit and possibly getting more space and more beds. And I was encouraged by the person working on the design, well, think big. What if you had you know, lots of space and resources and all of that? Well, I think we ought to have a sleep lab right down based on our spinal cord unit, just like we have a urodynamics lab. Our patients have this disorder commonly. I'd like to get the Cadillac study done on them right, right there. I'd like to be able to do limited studies in, in their rooms with some sort of uh, simpler equipment. I'd like to be able to study more than one patient a night because we have a lot of people uh, coming through for, uh, for follow-up. Probably everybody on CPAP and BiPAP should be getting some sort of periodic follow-up studies to make sure their pressures are okay and don't need to be upped or adjusted in some way. Um, one of my uh, uh, collaborators on some research was uh, looking into the idea maybe the nurses should have the primary role, role here. If they see someone who has obvious apnea, then set them up for a sleep study the next, the next night with one of these simple, uh, simple devices to do that. They're there during the night, and the physicians are usually home sleeping. Um, so we should have our own respiratory therapist. For reasons beyond this, our patients have a lot of respiratory problems, so we should have someone assigned to us. We should give them an office on our unit. They should have it all stocked with the CPAP and BiPAP machines and all the interfaces and just be ready to, to work with the, with the patients. Um, the spinal cord physicians, um, they should be collaborating with someone who's board certified in sleep medicine, and they probably should gain the ability to interpret the simple studies these things mostly score themselves on the, on the small machines, but be able to look at, look at those studies themselves and, and make some simple uh, determinations. We need to improve this. We should try this the next night on that person. So uh, just to mention some people who have supported my work on this topic in the, uh, in the past, so the Department of Veterans Affairs, uh, NIDER through the U.S. Department of Education, the SCI Model Systems Grant, and some work uh, su supported through the National Center for Injury Prevention and Control, um, a part of CDC. So thank you very much uh, for your attention, and we'll be taking questions uh, after uh, we have uh, one of our uh, uh, consumers speak about his experience with sleep apnea. Hi, my name's Chris, Chris Blanchard. Um, I guess, are you going to ask me some questions? Or yes, start I'm going to ask you some questions. So thank, thank, lie down. Thanks, Chris. Appreciate you uh, coming tonight to uh, discuss your experience. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, describe 
how you were diagnosed with sleep apnea? Um, well, I went into, uh, let me see, I, I wasn't sleeping. Um, and I went in and, and got basically diagnosed for it and, and went and, and was actually went to a therapist and was getting fitted for a mask. And, and, um, one day I, I, uh, I had a, a pneumonia after a, an operation and I wasn't sleeping well and actually didn't wake up very much one morning and, and my nurse that was taking care of me that day, she couldn't wake me up very well and so ended up calling the emergency or 911 and, and it turned out that I had a collapsed lung and pneumonia and, and uh, got treated for all those symptoms in the hospital and the, and uh, that went on from there. I, I basically, after coming home, we got onto a, a CPAP or BiPAP, <laughs> BiPAP, and um, no, it would be a CPAP, wouldn't it? Uh, uh, it could be either one, depending on what the settings are on the, right. on the machine. Can you describe what the what the machine is like and? What part of it's attached to you? Oh, well, it's a full mask. Well, over my nose and mouth, not my eyes, but um, and um, uh, it it breathes for me basically in in and out, and um, there's a, a water reservoir to keep it humidified and and. Uh, I was actually refitted myself with the therapist just before all this happened, so we knew that we were, something was going on and before all this happened. But um, it uh, took a while to get a mask fitted properly, and that that took a long time. But since then, we uh, it's been pretty good. It's it uh, it's uncomfortable, obviously, going on and in the morning waking up, but I seem to fall asleep and sleep all night, and, and uh, which is a plus. I hadn't been doing that. Actually, before my accident even, which was in 97, um, a girlfriend had noticed that I was not, I would stop breathing just for moments at a time. And it didn't affect me so much then, but since my spinal cord injury, you know, not having the diaphragm to to breathe with using just chest muscles, it, uh, it uh, affected me a lot more, and um, so that basically slowly went off the slippery slope after a while. So, um, now do you uh, do you use it every night, and do you use it if you're napping? No, I don't use it napping. I do use it every night. Um, I find I don't wake up at all in the middle of the night anymore. Rarely, unless I'm very cold or something. Um, and usually people have to wake me up in the morning, which never happened okay. before. I'd always wake up with the sunlight, basically. So. And um, uh, I know it's, it's been a while that you've been using it, but do you recall any other differences? Do you feel like you're, uh, you've had trouble with daytime sleepiness? Do when, you feel like you were poorly rested before? Before? Um, I would fall asleep in the office, okay. um, and it was partially because we didn't have the, you know, I mean, I'd have the doors shut and the heat on. I've learned to keep doors open with a little more ventilation now, um, so we keep the, the air quality better. But I was dozing off in the office daily, and now I've, it's not, I don't even come close to dozing off, and uh, I sleep better. Uh, no swelling in the legs or feet anymore. Um, you know, and generally better appetite. It, it definitely, it, it makes a difference. It's much better now than it was. Although, I hate the thing. I hate putting it on. I hate having it there. You know, it's uh, it's not very glamorous. That's for sure. But um, it works. Um, so. If you travel, is it something? I haven't traveled since I've been on it, since I've only been on it since late July or so. This, all this 
hospital stay and collapsed lung and all that happened in the beginning of June, I believe. So that I was in the hospital for almost three weeks because they had taken a CAT scan and the dyes that they put in my blood system or in your system created a kidney failure, so I had to go through dialysis and that was sort of a well, you know, a side effect that was not good, but um, once that all got cleared up and, and started breathing right, it was, we did okay, so. Now, it sounds like you were pretty sick when they were learning that this was going on and figuring it out. Um, there yeah, had some testing done at that point. Do you, do you recall any of the testing or did they do any follow-up testing with you on the, on the machines? I'm just wondering if you, you have any uh, uh, recollection of what the, what the testing involves. Um, Honestly, I don't have much recollection of uh, any of the testing. We, um, I, I, we did some breathing tests when I went into the therapist, to, you know, check the CO2 levels and and whatnot, and how well I was exchanging or bleeding off the CO2. Um, we did a few tests like that, and they were high to start, but they've gone way down since. And so there wasn't much testing before. I had all the problems, so it was more of a, a a visit with a therapist, and he said, "Let's try this," and and it was just after that that I got hit with the pneumonia and other problems. So, so. Okay. So it sounds like if you, if you didn't have to, to use that type of treatment, you rather rather wouldn't. That's no, pretty, I would. That's pretty obvious. Yes. But uh, it, it sounds like it's a it's a noticeable change for you, at least mm -hmm. as far as your day, daytime alertness and that's correct. being able to, to function. And I mm -hmm. think that's a you know, common thing for many many people is to notice a dramatic change to suddenly be getting a, a sound night's sleep for the first time in maybe months or or years. Yes, well, yes, probably years for me, yeah. since there were many many sleepless nights where I'd clock watch or. Like they say, or you know, wait, wait for the the sky to get lighter and whatnot. You know, it's not fun. And then getting up, and having to go to work the next day it was it was difficult. But well, it sounds like a big change if you you know sleep sleeping through the whole the whole night now. Yeah, it's it's much better. It's the the pros definitely outweigh the cons on, as far as that's concerned. And, only there was a one that wouldn't have to go over your face or sure. some other way to. I you know, went on. I before all this happened, I would actually use a, a little uh, desk fan and blow it the air sort of across my face up high. And summer times that was okay, but it, when in the winter time that got a little chilly, and uh, but that always triggered me to breathe a little bit more, and I noticed that some fresh air or whatnot. That definitely helped. But um, that didn't work after a while, or, or definitely not in the winter. Yeah. So. It's unfortunate that the treatment needs to be uh, yeah, as uh, uncomfortable as, as, it, as it can be for, for some people, but uh, you know, it uh, sounds like it's effective treatment for, for you and you're noticing a change. Yeah, getting the mask to fit properly, that's, that's a big one. We went through six different masks came back to the original one that we started with and uh, just have to snug it down a little tighter than it was probably recommended but that's the way we get stop any leaking and and whatnot because that's that would keep you awake if yeah. if it started leaking on you and so but overall I'd definitely recommend it to someone who hasn't tried it or needs to come up with something to help them sleep. So. And I have friends that are on it that aren't spinal cord injured, so, you know, it's... No, it's not just for people with spinal cord injuries. Yeah. So. Well, thanks a lot for, uh, for coming in and for sharing your experience oh. with the audience tonight. You bet, you bet. So I'll, I'll repeat the, the 
question. Uh, so if someone has one of these surgeries that I mentioned in my, in my talk, do they get away from needing to use the whole CPAP or BiPAP uh, setup? Um, sometimes they do. Um, the surgeries uh, are generally, generally reported that they're effective about 50% of the time. So uh, someone gets a really good response about 50% about of the time. Um, so uh, the other 50% may have to go on and continue to use it. The other case is people with very severe sleep apnea. I've seen where the surgeons say, we don't think we're going to be able to uh, treat it entirely with the, with the surgery. But what it will do is greatly reduce the pressure that we need to give somebody. We're having trouble getting the numbers even high enough to, to blow air in through, through CPAP or BiPAP. If he has the surgery, we could be using much lower pressures uh, that are more comfortable with a, with a mask on. So sometimes a combination approach is, uh, is what's needed. Uh, but the, the surgeries, there are none of them that are a, a sure thing. I guess I would say, well, a, a tracheostomy is going to be a sure thing for obstructive sleep apnea if that's the only thing going on because you're bypassing that problem completely, just opening up a hole below the spot where, it, where, it, uh, uh, where the airway is obstructing. But that's not, a, that's not a great treatment. There are a lot of downsides to, uh, to that. So uh, you know, I've only seen it considered for one patient that I, that I take care of, and the surgeons were very much against doing it, and that patient has not had that done. So with the oral, oral devices, the oral uh, appliances, they're particularly effective for mild to moderate sleep apnea. So uh, uh, someone who has just a small amount of airway obstruction, that may be all that they need. For somebody with very severe uh, apnea, very high, high index, and they're not effectively treated with a high pressure of, of, of CPAP, it's unlikely that the oral appliance is going to do it by itself. But you know, in my opinion, Many of the people with spinal cord injury probably don't have a very severe obstruction that it's, it's so tight and so collapsing there. It's, uh, the reason that they have it is that their breathing muscles are just not that strong or their, their chest collapses in as their diaphragm moves, moves downward, so they're not able to generate a strong enough uh, breath in. If they could only breathe in a little bit more, they would be okay. They would just be snoring. Maybe it converted somebody who was a snorer before their spinal cord injury. Now they have obstruction. So we might only have to improve the situation in the upper airway by a little bit, pulling the jaw and the tongue forward with an oral appliance or doing one of these surgeries. We may actually see a higher success rate with both of those in people with, with spinal cord injuries uh, just because the obstruction on average is probably not as, as bad. But um, that's one of, one of my thoughts, but that's not something that's been proven. Yeah, so that's a, that's a great question. The, so the, the question has to do with uh, body position. I mentioned in my talk that people are more likely to have obstructive sleep apnea if they're flat on their back and if they're on their, on their stomach or mostly over on their side toward their stomach, it's less likely all the structures up here are pulled forward by gravity um, and whether that could be accomplished with a, with a bed. The turning mattresses that exist just don't turn people that, that far, so it's getting things shifted. 30, 40 degrees over, but really not, not enough, and they're really not, they're shifting more around the, designed to shift the pelvis and not necessarily to flop someone over. Um, you know, the other limitation is that many people with, with spinal cord injuries uh, report that they just don't breathe well. Uh, so someone with relatively weak breathing muscles, you put them on their stomach and all their abdominal contents are pushed up like that, it's almost uh, you know, too much of a load to be pushing that stuff out of the, out of the way. So. Uh, in a survey we did, a lot of patients reported they could only sleep on their back, and then people who sleep on their back, a lot of them can't turn independently either. So it's potentially a good treatment for some people if they can sleep in, in, in that position. So that's, that's a good question. So uh, the, the question is uh, consequences of sleep apnea and consequences of sleep de deprivation. So someone maybe who's, uh, you know, not intentionally, but you know, is, is forced to be, to be up a lot of the time, young, young children, wh whatever, work, working a second job, that versus the risks uh, that come from, uh, from sleep apnea. There's some, there's some overlap in them, for example, uh, risk of uh, cardiovascular disease, risk of, of high blood pressure. Both of those are, are, um, are elevated, or it's eleva those risks are elevated by, by either disorder. Um, and it, it's going to be additive. If you're having very, very little sleep, and the sleep you're having is poor quality, that's going to be, that's going to be worse than one or the other, a full, a full night of not so restful sleep or a very
very short night of rest, restful sleep. Uh, but a yeah, short night of non-restful sleep is going to be the, be the worst case. So it'll be sim similar health consequences, not exactly the, uh, the same, and probably an additive risk uh, between the two. So, so the question has to do with someone who, who traveled and chose not to take CPAP with them, and then they had uh, difficulty uh, sleeping when they were not using it. So uh, that's, that's definitely believable and, and uh, you know, could, could very well be, be related. Um, so uh, people who are using it and having a, a good benefit, they're using it you know, almost every, every night. Um, and uh, the body doesn't react well to these apnea episodes, and the body will, the body will wake, wake up, and uh, it can be very difficult falling, falling asleep. Uh, for someone, it's you know suddenly like having sleep apnea again. If you if you are using CPAP, you don't have sleep apnea. So it was you know in one night quick, quickly switching back to to having it and and feeling the uh, uh, the acute consequences. And I'm sure if he had insomnia and didn't sleep, he was probably feeling fatigued after a day or two of doing that. Now fortunately, the the machines are small enough, and they're the idea is that people should bring them, you know, with them even when they're traveling. That it is pretty practical to bring bring it along, as long as you're going somewhere that has power to to plug the thing in. Uh, but most of them come with even some sort of a travel bag. And people who show up at my my hospital, uh, pay, people with SEI who are being admitted, they show up with their CPAP machine. They know that, you know, we're not going to be providing one. They should be using their home machine with those settings. And uh, that's a good sign when somebody shows up with with their machine with them. I'm thinking they're probably using it at home. They're not bringing this for, uh, for show. And the machines are uh, smart enough uh, to give us data how much they're, they're turned on, some of them pretty sophisticated, but at a minimum just the run time. So when somebody comes in, we can look and see how much use there actually has, has been. And we're not necessarily shooting for, you have to have it on every minute of the, of the night. People will still report a benefit if they're using it five or six hours or so. That's considered good good enough to get a benefit. But uh, as I showed in my presentation, many people with SCI are sleeping with it closer to seven, seven and a half hours on um, tolerating that and perceiving a, a benefit. Well, no, that's actually an ex excellent point. So if someone's carrying a, a card with them that has some med medical information, if they happen to be hospitalized and someone was you know, looking to see what things they're they're at risk for and what their what their treatments are. Yeah, you would want you would want the hospital to be be aware that you have have sleep apnea. Uh, there have been cases reported of patients dying after having uh, surgery uh, with the sedative medications on board and all of that. You're more likely to be uh, be having apnea right after surgery and uh, need a higher level of, of monitoring. So uh, yeah, it would be uh, something good to uh, to have available to people. Maybe not to the level of having it on a medical alert bracelet or something like that, but if someone had a, a concise, you know, top five health issues for you, that that, that would be on, on there if you were not able to express that yourself. Yeah, so there's a, the question is about uh, uh, breathing through through your mouth or mouth, mouth being open, um, uh, and is this specifically while you're using, using CPAP? So, uh, so unfortunately, some people do just fine with a, a nose mask, but then they need a chin strap to keep their jaws shut because uh, otherwise you're sort of creating a leak of leak of pressure and not getting the the full effect from the uh, from the CPAP. So, for some people, that's a better alternative than doing a mask that goes over the over the mouth and nose. It really comes down to trial and error with the the chin straps and the different designs of, of masks. Some people have to alternate between one and another uh, just to avoid, avoid irritation. Um, and uh, uh, you know, as our consumer mentioned earlier, having to try five or six masks, that's, that's not unusual at, at all. But uh, eventually people settle on something that's going to work for them or alternating between, between two and then can do very well with that for the, the long run. Um, it's probably still a good idea to have a follow-up study at some point if that's available, at least a limited study, to make sure that, yeah, this is, that, that these settings are still working okay for me and accomplishing what, what I need. But, uh, yeah, unfortunately, there's a lot of trial and error that the uh, sleep tech should be working with or a respiratory therapist to, to get something that's going to work for any one patient. So uh, the, the question is, uh, if, your, if your oxygen level is, is okay, uh, how, would, how would you also know that your carbon dioxide level is okay? There's, there's no way to know for sure without, without testing it. Now, people who don't have much weakness of their breathing, breathing muscles, 
and the only problem going on is obstructive sleep apnea. The carbon dioxide isn't really a, a concern. Your breathing starts up again and you blow that off, off quickly. It's more for people uh, with uh, some amount of weakness of their, their uh, breathing muscles, people with, with higher level spinal cord injuries, people with neuromuscular diseases, where that could be going on. And if you've got good, healthy lungs, they might be pulling in enough oxygen but there's not enough air moving in and out to get the, get the carbon dioxide out of, out of the body. So um, uh, just because the oxygen level is okay doesn't mean that the carbon dioxide uh, uh, isn't, isn't a little, little high. Um, and uh, there's not a, uh, a readily available test. We're just not routinely doing these end tidal CO2 uh, measurements. Um, and uh, for diagnosing if someone all the time is not doing enough breathing, which is a, also a common thing, daytime and nighttime not doing enough breathing, we would usually do the test uh, doing an arterial blood gas, putting a needle in at the, at the wrist and testing the blood that way. Then we know exactly how much oxygen and carbon dioxide is, is in there. Um, but there's not, a, there's not a readily available test. It may be that over time those will be uh, more common, but uh, in general, the people walking into a sleep medicine clinic who don't have spinal cord injuries or other neuromuscular disease, they just don't have that problem with carbon dioxide staying in their body, so the labs aren't set up for doing that, that measurement. It has to be somebody with that in mind. Maybe there's hypoventilation going on. Maybe we need to check a, a carbon dioxide level. Maybe we need to do a very specialized sleep study where we're measuring uh, carbon dioxide continuously through the, through the study. It definitely can be, can be done. It's just not one of their 30 things that they usually hook up in those labs because it's not a common enough problem in the, in the population they see. Okay, well thanks. Uh, great questions everyone and uh, uh, thank you for your participation tonight.